Hello everyone. Happy October and welcome to the dark side of Lake County history. My name is Cheyenne Blue. I'm a real estate agent with Country Air Properties, though I look like a modern day Morticia today. And I wanted to do that for the month of October based on the theme and the stories that we are going to be telling. During the month of October, I'm going to be telling a combination of myths, legends, and true histories surrounding Lake County. What I will be talking about today is one of the biggest, darkest secrets of Lake County. I contemplated telling the story until the end of the month just because of how big it is, but I've been wanting to do this story for many, many months and get it out there so that way more people understood what happened here and the true devastation that lies behind Kelseyville and Bloody Island. Warning, this video is for mature audiences. It contains themes that may be traumatizing for some viewers, including brutal violence, child cruelty, sexual assault, and much more. Your discretion is advised. Now with my version of what I'm gonna be telling, I used a combination of different stories. That way I could kind of fill in some of the gaps with uh, some things, but the main way is the native stories, the ones that were actually there when it happened, uh, Chief Augustine, his wife, the accounts that were written down for them, those are the ones that held the most weight for me in telling this story, um, as well as what is documented in history. A lot of my research I got through Malden's notes, which I will leave a link down below where you can access them. Uh, I also read a few books, um, articles, things along that line, just because it fascinated me that something this big happened and nobody seems to know about it, even the people that live here. People know Bloody Island. They know that people were killed, but they don't know really what led up to it and the true detriment that happened to the Pomo natives back then. So without further ado, let's get into the dark history of Kelseyville. In Bloody Island. In 1820, the land was peaceful. Clear Lake's ten Native American communities had been living the way that they had for thousands and thousands of years. Hunting, fishing, having their own shell bead economy as trade, grain and acorn processing, it was all serving them well and they were living in a very cohesive way. Little did they know that this peace was about to come to an abrupt end. In 1822, Mexico won its independence from Spain. A man by the name of Mariano Vallejo was appointed as commander of Mexico's northern frontier. With this, he made all Native Americans his subjects, more like his slaves. There's a lot more to his story as well, and I do want to do a feature just on him and the things that he did. It was more all over the place, like not just Lake County, but all over. I want to make this video more directly tied to Lake County, Kelseyville, and Bloody Island. So if you would like to know more about Mariano Vallejo, then make sure to comment below so I know to make a video about him. He built a log home and a corral in Big Valley just north of Kelseyville. Here he would have his cattle ranch, which was tended by the natives as well as his Mexican command. The difference that he treated the Mexican command as he did the natives was completely different. The Mexican command, he used them more as people, where the natives, he saw them more as inventory. He saw them the same as he did his cattle. The natives' living conditions when they were with Mariano were horrible. They were kept in dirty, cold areas with barely anything to wear and not much to eat. George Simpson that visited Mariano said that the natives were more in a vegetative state than they were actually living because of the conditions they were kept in. The natives that resisted the indentured servitude at his factory slash ranch started killing Mariano's cattle to feed themselves. With Mariano coming in and his mass expansion, he had made it to where the normal game that the natives would hunt were gone. They were dead. Either Mariano's military or Mariano himself would just slaughter everything that they saw in sight to feed their own people. 
So the natives that had been on this land for, you know, centuries and centuries, they didn't have the stuff that they did for all these generations. So in order to keep themselves alive and going, they had to resort to killing the cattle. There was just not enough for the natives to keep themselves and their tribes fed if they didn't join Mariano. And even if they were to join Mariano, they were still malnourished. In one case, Mariano noticed that there were 35 cattle missing. No idea why they went missing. Wasn't said if they were found dead or, you know, they just were up and missing. They counted the cattle and, oh, there's 35 missing. No idea what happened. But because he had 35 cattle missing, he decided, oh, it must be the natives. Of course, we're going to blame it on the natives. So in order to replace the 35 cattle, he rounded up 35 Native Americans and slaughtered them indiscriminately. All of them were shot in cold blood. And it still was never confirmed if the cattle just wandered off or were killed by what or whom. I mean, we have larger predators out here besides man. You know, mountain lions, I've talked about this before, we have mountain lions, bears, they can step on a snake and die that way. I mean, there's so many different things that could have happened with the cattle, but no, we're just going to blame it on the natives because that's what they did. But Mariano was tame compared to his brother Salvador. You see, Salvador, he lived in the shadow of his famous brother, Mariano, and nothing he could do could really seem to outshine what his brother was doing. He was kind of like his brother's henchman, in sorts. Anything that Mariano wanted, he was the one that would usually be the executioner for whatever Mariano told him to do. Salvador carried out the larger acts of cruelty from abduction, murder, torture, and... In 1843, Salvador was sent out to gather up more natives to bring back to his brother to work for him. One of those stops was the village of Camdot on Anderson Island. Here is the site that Salvador killed the chief and set the village dance house on fire containing most of the village. He had women, children, all in that dance house and set it on fire. There are accounts from soldiers saying that you could hear their skin crackling as they burned alive. This would come to be known as the Camdot Massacre. You really don't hear much about it though. We do have the marker for Bloody Island, but the Camdot Massacre? I didn't even really know about it until I started digging further into the dark history surrounding Kelseyville and this particular massacre, you know, the uh, Bloody Island Massacre. I had never once heard about it before. And to me, that, I feel like we should have known about that. That is horrible. An entire village burned alive just because they didn't want to work for Mariano Vallejo. And it wasn't like Salvador could just go back to his brother and be like, oh, well, these people don't want to work for you. This particular massacre was up to Salvador. Which is why I say between the two brothers, he definitely seems to be the most cruel. In 1847, Mariano lost his command over the troops. And he's like, oh shoot, I've angered all these Native Americans. I better get the heck out of here. Hence, why you do not brutally murder people, sir. They are going to retaliate. You should have thought about this a long time ago. But no, you didn't. You just are just like, oh, I'm just going to murder all these people. So they up and left and they took a majority of the cattle with them to Napa Valley. After Vallejo left with the majority of the cattle, the Pomos, they rejoice. They're just like, thank goodness we are finally rid of this horrible person. We can finally live as the way that we used to. And they rounded up the extra wild cattle they were left there alone, so I mean, why not round them up and make sure to feed your villages? So they claimed the remaining cattle as their own and tended to them as such. This same year, Charles Stone, Andrew, and Ben Kelsey move in. Vallejo sold his remaining stock in Clear Lake and gave them the rights to graze over in Big Valley. 
So Andrew Kelsey and Charles Stone moved to Big Valley in order to tend to the herd. They were initially welcomed by the natives. I mean, these guys, they had gone through all this torture already, and yet they still welcomed these strangers with open arms. Andrew and Charles' treatment towards the natives was also very pleasant. They had no reason to fear them, at least not in the beginning. They told the natives that they would basically take care of them and make it to where they wouldn't have to hunt anymore in exchange for the natives to work for them. Another thing was they would have to move onto the land and they would live there. They would have their own housing that Kelsey and Stone would help them take care of. So, I mean, everything seemed amazing. Like After all the, this cruelty by the Vallejos, it seemed like, you know, a godsend that these men came here and they were being so kind to the natives. They had the natives build them an adobe that was 15 foot wide by 40 foot long with two rooms over by Kelsey Creek. Along with this, they also had them build a large corral for the cattle. It was estimated that there was between four and 500 Pomo that helped work on this giant adobe home for Stone and Kelsey. To feed them, they were allowed to slaughter one steer a day from out of the herd. After the natives had moved in and started working for them, they had the natives hand over their own weapons because they, quote, didn't need them anymore. Sounds like a happy ending or the start of, to one, right? Not even close. Once those weapons were handed over, everything changed. Their steer a day turned into four cups a week per day per person. A simple complaint turned into their hands being tied, hoisted into a tree, and whipped, only to be left there for hours on end, hanging by their hands. Kelsey, he would entertain his guests by shooting at the feet of the natives, making them jump and dance. Oh, and there was also the recreational lashing for their entertainment. The Pomo girls were taken by Stone and Kelsey to live with them and do as they wished. If the parents were asked to bring their girls and they begged the people not to take them, the parents then would be chained up, tied up, and whipped just for begging them not to take their daughters away from them. Both the Pomo and the white visitors both said that if the Pomo were to complain about anything, it didn't matter what it was, I mean, you could even complain basically about your back hurting, then they would get the same treatment of being hoisted into the trees, whipped, and then left there for hours. This happened regularly, at least two to three times a week. Do the math. This also happened to people that would hunt on the lands. The only reason why they even would try to hunt on the lands is because their families were starving. As I had said before, a lot of the game had been wiped out and all there really was was the cattle left. A young boy, to avoid being tortured, asked one of the workers for more food because his mother was starving. Stone found out about this. <laughs> Instead of torturing him, shot the boy in cold blood. When a raccoon got into a crop of watermelon, the Pomo man that was in charge of that watermelon crop killed because of his negligence. Some of you might not know much about animals, but as far as raccoons, they are very sneaky. They get into stuff even if you are standing there, and they're very quiet too, so... Knowing this as a person that's been around animals all my life, it would be so easy for a raccoon to sneak in there without anybody knowing, and... I mean, getting killed because a raccoon got into a crop. On top of all this, children were being sold as slaves, and young girls were sexually assaulted on a regular basis. The Pomo were starting to get tired of the treatment. Can you blame them? They surrounded Stone and Kelsey's home with them inside. One of the natives that wanted peace traveled to Sonoma, where Sam and Ben Kelsey lived. They are Andrew Kelsey's brothers. They put together a group of Pomo men to follow them in order to break up the siege. They were successful this time. After the siege, Andrew Kelsey sent out an army of 144 Pomo to fight the Scotts Valley band suspected of stealing cattle. None were found. Then they went to the Blue Lake Canyon where they found one Pomo. 
they tortured him brutally until he finally gave up where the rest of the tribe was located. He was forced to take the men to where they were hiding. Once they were there, they rounded them all up to make them as slaves and burned the village to the ground. Andrew Kelsey's brother Ben took 172 Palmo to himself up to Sonoma to build him adobes for two months. Chief Augustine, the chief to the Big Valley tribe, I want to pronounce this, but I really don't want to butcher it, so I'm going to put it right here as to what the native name to them was. He was one of the Pomos that was taken up to Sonoma with everyone else, and he ended up escaping back to Clear Lake. Andrew and Stone ended up finding him, and as punishment, tied him up in a sweat lodge for an entire week with only bread and water. They used the Pomos' sacred building in order to torture this man. If that's not cruel, I don't know what is. In 1849, Ben Kelsey took 26 Clear Lake Pomo on a one-month trip over to the gold fields on Feather River. They mined a bag of gold for Kelsey that was as large as a man's arm. Well, I'm not a man's arm. I have a pretty small arm, actually, so I guess that's not a good description. <laughs> But that was their description, um, a bag of gold as large as a man's arm. All returned safely and as a reward, they were paid a pair of overalls, a hickory shirt, and a handkerchief for a month of work. Kelsey, he used the gold to buy a thousand head of cattle. Because of the success they had, Ben Kelsey put together a second gold expedition. He handpicked a hundred he handpicked a hundred Palmo to take back with him to Sonoma to the mines. With him, he took his brother Sam, William Boggs, Salvador Vallejo, remember him, and four other white men. This time, he also brought a herd of sheep, but the Palmo, they were denied food. They got nothing to eat, and because of this, two of them starved to death on the trail up there. In the middle of the expedition, there was an outbreak of malaria between both the natives and the whites. Ben Kelsey had to be carried back on a bed, or what we call today a stretcher. And the Pomo? They were left in the Sierras, in the Calusa Indian Territory, that were enemies of the Pomo. Between the malaria, the harsh winter climate, and the enemies, out of a hundred Pomo, Three came back alive. Stone and Kelsey had a plan. They didn't want to deal with the non-workable Pomo anymore with their ranch. They only wanted the strong. So they wanted to put together a march to take all the elders and the children over to Sacramento. And to tie the group together for the march, the Pomo were forced to make their own ropes in order to tie all of them together and take them down there. Finally, the Pomo understandably snapped. And it's not quite understood what exactly caused the snap. There are many different accounts as to what it was that finally made them do what they did for them to finally get the justice that they deserve. Some of the factors that are stated in the stories are plans to drive all the elders and children down to Sacramento, the deaths of the Palma taken at the gold fields, the two years of starvation, whippings, torture, and abuse, which, I mean, that's probably a large factor that went into it, regardless of what the straw that broke the camel's back was, the killing of a young boy that fell in love with one of the girls that was living with Stone and Kelsey, another one was the rape of the chief's daughter. There are many different stories. The one that I remember hearing the most was the rape of the chief's daughter that caused them to finally snap. The natives made plans to revolt. There are a few different stories, and these I kind of compiled together in order to um, give you guys one fluid story instead of saying, well, this is what this person has said, this is what this person said. I took the things that were the same going through most of the stories. If you would like to read the stories for yourself, I am going to put in the link for Malden's notes and some of the other areas where I was able to find stories. 
The workers told the girls that were living with Kelsey and Stone their plan to kill the two of them. Not the girls, but Kelsey and Stone. The girls watched over and told the rest of the Palmo when Kelsey and Stone had sat down to eat their breakfast, unaware of what was going to happen next. They all rushed in at once. Andrew was knocked down by an arrow and he tried to crawl off into the willows where he was met by one of the old Pomo men that hit him over the head with a rock, killing him instantly. Stone ran into the sleeping house where he grabbed one of his rifles to fire back at the natives. Nothing came out. The girls had wetted the rifles the night before so that way the guns wouldn't fire if they even tried to shoot the guns on them if they were to get to them somehow. He then pulled out a knife to fight back at the pomo that were surrounding him. But oops, someone tripped on his long coat and he fell. He got trampled and they slit his throat with his own knife. After both the men were dead, Kelsey was buried in the creek and Stone was buried near the house. They finally got justice, right? Get into the story. Bad guys get punished and killed, but no, it doesn't end here. As though it should, the story continues and gets worse. The Pomo get a few months of peace. They did expect immediate retaliation for what they had done, but nothing happened. They try to get back a sense of normalcy while rebuilding a normalcy. They thought that after everything they were free at last. Sam and Ben Kelsey hear about their brother's murder. They wanted revenge. Ben called the troops and organized a group of settlers who rode off and murdered a large number of natives in the lower part of Napa Valley. They asked the whites to separate their own native slaves from the strange or unknown Indians. Even if it was something like they owned a native and simply forgot that that was one of their natives, they got killed. Natives were killed indiscriminately. The strange natives were brutalized, shot, or burned to death by the Kelsey Company. Another party of about 40 to 50 settlers led by Sam Kelsey and a Mormon named Joseph Smith started near Yachtville, burning and killing their way south, pausing just long enough near Sonoma to announce that they would hunt every Indian, male and female, throughout the territory. They became known as the Sonoma Raiders. They ended up getting arrested because one of the ranchers complained about them, but they were let out on bail because good old justice system, right? You're probably thinking, wait, that was over in Sonoma. I thought we were talking about the Bloody Island story. Trust me, I'm getting to that. But the Bloody Island story, it's like, it led up to that. It wasn't just Bloody Island. They killed left and right any native that they saw to avenge their brother's death because, you know, his, their brother was such an amazing guy. The revenge on the Clear Lake Palma was issued to a General Smith, who then issues it to Lieutenant Stoneman. Stoneman was the one that would lead the soldiers. On arriving at Kelsey's home, there were no longer any natives present there. They had all picked up and moved back to where they originally were from. They did, however, find the remains and buried them properly. Quite frankly, I think that was too good for them, but I mean, what do I know? They traveled to the north end of the lake. There they found the Palmo of the village of, and I'm going to put the name here because I do not want to butcher that name. I don't want to cause any disrespect or anything like that. Um, I have a hard enough time speaking in general. <laughs> So here's the name to the village. It was on an island surrounded by Tule Marsh. From the shore, their rifles were out of range. Lake watchers saw the boat come coming around the Buckingham Point. Lookouts posted on Kanaktai saw boats with red cloth on a pole on the bow and each with 10 to 15 men. Each boat with 10 to 15 men. Smoke signals were given. Trail watchers on Ash Hill saw the infantry coming around the Lakeport side. 
and also sent up signals. The infantry shot off big guns a few times in Scotts Valley. They ended up camping they ended up camping on Emerson Hill by Upper Lake. Even though they were a pomo of a different tribe from the ones that Kelsey's enslaved, they still got repercussions from what had gone on in the past. And you know they hear stories, they see things, and yet they still met the troops with kindness. But the white men, they were determined to kill. Another lieutenant, Lieutenant Lyon, led two more companies of reinforcements. He obtained two whaleboats with supplies strapped to wagon running gear and two mountain howitzers. These were trailed to Lower Lake. By this time, many Napa residents had joined the group and all met at Anderson's ranch at Lower Lake. Part of the soldiers' cannon and whale boats headed up the lake. Stoneman led the mounted soldiers and volunteers to the west side of the lake. The two parties met at the point near Robinson's place. In the morning, the soldiers killed their two Indian guides, their own guides they murdered. One shot and one was hung. During the night, the volunteers were put in position north of the island. In the morning, a few shots, still falling short, attracted the attention of the villagers. Meanwhile, the boats with the soldiers came up on the opposite side of the island. At the signal, the cannon blew canister shot into the village, sending the Pomo running south over the island where a line of soldiers rose up from the Thule and dispensed a volley of musket fire into the village. Ge Hui Li threw up his hands and said, No harm, me good man. He was shot in the arm, and the man next to him was shot dead. Most ran and hid in the tulis, but four or five fought back, and another was shot in the shoulder. Many women and children were killed. One woman reports seeing two white men with their guns held in the air with a little girl hanging off from the bayonets. They threw her into the water. Two more did the same, this time with a little boy. A wounded mother with a baby were both stabbed and thrown into the lake. It took four to five days to pick up all the dead. It was discovered that all the children had been stabbed to death, as were most of the women. All the dead were burned on the east side of the creek. The whites had caught a pomo during the march through Scotts Valley. They had hung him in the camp and built a fire under him. Another was tied to the tree and burned to death beforehand being clubbed by them with their guns and oars. The village, they burned to ash. When they finished at the island village, the military traveled up to Potter Valley and then back through Ukiah Valley, where they attacked yet another village, down the Russian River to Santa Rosa, Sonoma, and then to Benicia. The expedition had taken more than a month. So as you can see, it wasn't just Bloody Island. It was bloody everywhere. All those natives had nothing to do with the murders. And to me, I feel like those murders were justice for the natives that carried it out. Tens of thousands of native lives were taken because of these people. Like I said, I didn't get too much into Salvador and Mariano's story, but they killed many more besides what I spoke about today. Entire villages were tortured and wiped out because of cruelty and ruthless acts of blind revenge. But was it really revenge? Or just a sick game played by sick men? The stories I pulled were stories told by the natives I compiled together from Alden's notes and other history books. I read the stories of the generals and it just made me sick to read. I didn't want them to have any part in the stories that I told because quite frankly they were so whitewashed just trying to make it look like they were the good guys in all of this. And also they looked at it more as a glorified hunt than the killing of many innocent lives. And that shouldn't have any place in our history. They were true psychopaths before people really truly understood the term of psychopaths. And I don't want to tell their stories. I want the stories of the victims to be heard. Some might say that this happened a long time ago, but if you think about it, it was only seven, eight generations ago. 
70-year-old Clayton Duncan, a descendant of one of the survivors of Bloody Island, he heard stories growing up from his great-grandmother, Lucy, who was one of the survivors of the massacre. Someone that is living today heard the stories directly from a survivor of the massacre. That's just too close to today. How did his great-grandmother survive? By hiding in the water, using a tule to breathe. It was a game that her and the other children had done for a long time. It was like their game of hide-and-seek. And it was what they did to survive. When she came up after everything went quiet, she saw all her cousins, grandmas, grandparents in general, laying in a massive pool of blood. If you drive by on the highway, you may see a rock monument. Stop by and read it. It doesn't fully grasp the detriment these people went through, but it holds a reminder of what happened all those years ago. Clayton Duncan, the man that I was talking about prior, who is related to Lucy, her name's actually Lucy Moore, he was the one that petitioned to get that plaque put in, and rightfully so. The army estimated over 200 people were killed, but by the tribe's documentation, it was over 400. There was so much taken from these people, even over 100 years later, the pain is still felt within the tribes. I wish the tribes health, prosperity, healing, and a promising future. There is a petition to change the name of Kelseyville to Kanaktai. I am in full support of this petition. It is a step towards the healing for these people in a way that we could say we're sorry for what happened. Take down the name of the person that has caused so much pain and cruelty and honor the name of the sacred volcano Mount Kanaktai. I really hope you didn't enjoy this story, but I hope it opened your eyes. And until next time, have a good one.